war films. This will be like a part one of war film episodes that we do. And this episode will be going over Saving Private Ryan, 1917, Full Metal Jacket, Fury. It's a great list. Yeah, there are, there's a little diversity of, of wars going on. We got World War One, World War Two, Vietnam. So, and these films are all very different. So I think it's a great list to go over so that we don't get a little too repetitive with the, with the movies involved. Yeah, the tone of these films vary from one another and they add a lot of... Uh, a scope in terms of how you can tell the story of a war film, and I'm excited to talk about them. This episode of Raiders of the Lost Podcast is brought to you by our friends at MoviePosters.com. Use coupon code RAIDERS15 to get 15% off your order today, just in time for the holiday season. This episode is also brought to you by Manscaped.com. The holiday season is here. Now is the perfect time to get your gifts with Manscaped to avoid those long lines and COVID restrictions at stores. Manscaped has a massive holiday sale running through Black Friday all the way to Cyber Monday, offering 25% off and free shipping on your entire order. Don't forget to use our coupon code Raiders of the Lost at checkout. Again, Raiders of the Lost at checkout. 25% off and free shipping your entire order. It's the holiday season. You got to get this done. Let's go. That's a good deal. It's a really good deal. 25% off. If you enjoy our podcast and want to help us grow, the best thing you can do is subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts. Leaving a five-star review is incredibly beneficial, especially those written ones. Helps us get seen by new people. And we also have a Patreon if you want to help support us monthly. Members get special perks. We have different tiers. So $2 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month. So you don't have to really commit that much. $2 a month, that's less than a cup of coffee a month just to help support us. And we're using the money to improve our set to buy new props. And and we got new microphones. We have another wall coming in. So we're putting the money to great use. Members get special perks like personalized videos and a monthly shout out on the podcast. As always, spoilers are abound. If you're fans of our podcast, make sure to check out one of our favorite movie reviewers on TikTok, Liam Pringle, at Liam Pringle one He does a ton of great movie reviews. Check him out for quick movie reviews on TikTok, at Liam Pringle one Happy Thanksgiving to everyone tuning in. Hopefully we're helping you make it through those long drives to see your family or finishing off your nightcap of dessert while watching us on YouTube right now. Our first film on the list is Saving Private Ryan, which came out on July 24th in 1998. Directed by Steven Spielberg and written by Robert Rodat, the film stars Tom Hanks, Matt Damon, Tom Sizemore, and Edward Burns. The film grossed $482 million on a budget of $70 million. After escaping the horror that was the D-Day invasion, Captain Miller and his men embark on a dangerous mission behind enemy lines. They are there to find Private Ryan, as his three brothers had all been killed in action. These men are forced to answer the question, why are we risking all of our lives just to save one? Saving Private Ryan is an incredibly powerful film. Every time you watch it, it you just take something new from it. Um, it's probably the most accurate and realistic war movie ever made, according to historians and World War II vets. Although, of course, it's Hollywood eyes. It's not a documentary. They're telling a story. So between historians and survivors, aside from that, very accurate. And there was an actual case of uh, a woman who had reportedly lost four sons in war during the Civil War. And uh, she, uh, a friend of hers wrote a letter to Abraham Lincoln who um, sent um, condolences to her, a personalized letter to her. So there has been in instances similar to this storyline, so it's not so far-fetched. And in terms of the film itself, I think it is easily one of the most definitive World War II films in history. And Spielberg, being the master filmmaker he is, he has crafted masterpieces in all sorts of genres, whether it be sci-fi, war, uh, action, adventure, uh, horror. So I think he, he has such a range as a filmmaker that it doesn't matter what, what genre he's doing. He's He helps define each genre with his own films. And his skill, just in terms of World War II, which is a category and a subject he's very fascinated in, clearly... He does it in a different types of genres. So, like, obviously, Schindler's List, it's a very dark look at the concentration camps during World War II. And then with uh, Saving Private Ryan, we get the actual war and what that was like. But then he has uh, other instances in other films, like Indiana Jones, obviously, where he's more playful with World War II and obviously that rivalry between Indiana Jones and the Nazis in there. So he, is, he attacks this subject, obviously, because it's a very po common, popular subject to make a story about. Uh, with so many different points of view that obviously it's because he such, has such wide range, like you just said, as a filmmaker. Yeah, and I think with this film, he brought something we had never seen before, which is the visual aesthetic of, of Saving Private Ryan, where obviously they shot mostly handheld. They also uh, threw the shutter up to make it more crisp 
and sharper images. Spielberg based uh, his vision for this film upon real documentary footage of World War II and World War I. And filmmakers like uh, the great John Ford, who ended up making a ton of great films, he actually made documentaries about the famous battles of World War II. And what Spielberg found when he watched the footage in this is that the, the, the cameramen during these battles, they would often stay low. The cameras would shake whenever there was an explosion near them. And so he based the camera techniques in this film upon the documentary and footage from these uh, documentaries about each battle. And that's why the film feels so authentic because he based it upon the real footage that those men captured. And one of my favorite parts about this cinematography-wise is the opening Omaha battle, the beach scene, which is 24 minutes long of just straight mayhem and battle. He didn't storyboard that entire sequence at all, so they went into it with spontaneity and the actions of those scenes and what was ever, whatever was going on at the battle that dictated where the camera would be looking, where the camera would be placed. So it's really interesting how he created this realistic environment for the audience to, to make you feel what it's really like in that battle. And obviously that battle is the highlight of the film. And actually they spent the majority of the production filming this battle scene. They spent uh, 25 days filming just the Omaha beach scene. And the entire shoot of the film was 56 days. So uh, they spent more time on this than anything. They also spent $11 million to produce the Omaha beach scene alone. Because there's so many extras, so much uh, production design involved, so many pyrotechnics. So it was an, 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 uh, making a film in its own, making this Omaha Beach scene. And I think that a lot of people, if they think about the scene, obviously it's very chaotic. The way he filmed his handheld is very shaky. But it's not like modern action movies where it's shaky handheld camera work along with very quick cuts. Spielberg actually only used 200 shots throughout this entire sequence, which is 24 minutes long. Therefore, the average shot lasts seven seconds. And it, you, you might not think that that's true, but if you watch it again, and you'll notice that rather than editing, Spielberg does what he always does as a ma master blocker, where he puts the camera in different angles to create different shots for each take. And so he'll, he'll have the camera start out on the actor's face, and then he'll show, then he'll, he'll pan and tilt to show different aspects of the scene. And then he'll set up five different shots with, with each take. And so, yes, the, the, the sequence is very chaotic and handheld and, and um, all over the place, but his ability to tell a story without editing so much helps you stay aware and helps you process what's going on. So you're not lost by a thousand edits. So he he's wisely shoots handheld but uses long takes. And seven seconds might not seem like a long take, but it actually really is when you're talking about the average film. Seven seconds is a long even take. For, even for a dialogue scene, seven seconds per shot is pretty long. So just a little background and history of this scene and the, the setting of this movie. On June 6, 1944, is D-Day, where, where the Allied forces of Britain, America, Canada, and France attacked German forces on the coast of Normandy, France, with a huge force of over 150,000 soldiers. The Allies attacked and gained a victory that became the turning point for World War II. A little over 4,500 Allied troops were confirmed killed, 9,000 were injured or missing, between 4,000 and 9,000 Germans were killed just on this one day. And so what happened were there were multiple beaches that were hit on the same day, on the same point. Each beach was uniquely dangerous. There were about 2.9% fatalities for Utah, 10.8% of those at Omaha died, 4.1% on gold, 5.8% on Juno, and 4.5% 4 on sword. So there's a pretty Are those high, all beaches? Those are the beaches and the probability of death for Allied troops. And I believe Americans had the highest fatality rate of all Allied troops. And D-Day lasted two and a half months and resulted in roughly 250,000 casualties on both sides. And this particular day, um, the storming of Normandy, it was uh, pretty much uh, the worst circumstances you can put yourself in in warfare in terms of the Allied side of the war because... The Allied forces had to traverse from water onto a beach on foot while being fired upon by heavily fortified machine guns from a raised platform. So it's it's probably the worst situation you can find yourself in a battle, but it was the only way that the Allied forces can ever could ever um, breach Normandy. Well, it's that this is our good, bad, and worst idea, and this is probably the, what we have to do to be able to secure this position to at least make a dent in this war. Yeah, it was the, it was the only way to, uh, to to break through that part of Western Europe was to, to attack Normandy and try to break through. And the only way to break through was to keep moving forward. And the only way to keep moving forward was uh, 
put your head down and just run across the beach. And Spielberg wants to make you feel like those soldiers. He wants to make you feel disoriented. He wants to make you feel terrified. Obviously, we're going from water, like you just said. And he shows soldiers just drowning underneath the boats that they're being hauled into on. They're being drowned and held down by the weight of all their gear. Some men are even being shot before they even leave the boats, before the boats even touch sand. Um, it's just bloodshed everywhere. There are people with their limbs being blown off and um, even when Miller, played by Tom Hanks, he he loses consciousness or vision for a little bit and we kind of have that ringing in our ears and again, the disorientation because he wants you to feel like you're on that beach with these men and you're going through what they're going through, which is why it's not perfectly filmed. It's not perfectly executed like that on purpose. It's purposely those shaky cam shots. You don't know where, you don't know what's going to happen. It's kind of like the opening scene for Gladiator. Yeah, and Spielberg actually even told his cameramen, um, he would shoot with a few cameras at a time during each take. And he told his cameramen to be spontaneous with, with, with what they captured because he wanted it to feel spontaneous and unpredictable like it was on the beach. Like if you landed there, you didn't know what was going to happen. And the production of the scene alone involved 1,000 extras, um, some of whom were already members of the Irish Army Reserve, so they had experience. And of all of the extras, there, there were actually about 30 amputees um, involved in the, in the scene. And what they did was they attached fake limbs to them uh, fake prosthet prosthetic limbs with uh, explosives in there so that whenever a, a soldier gets their limb blown off in the film, it's not CGI. It's actually an amputee who special effects goes off and it explodes the limb off of them in blood splatter so it looks like it's a real person lo losing their limb. And that's a perfect example of how complex the scene was because in addition to shots like that, which you probably have to get a couple takes at, but you can't do back to back. You have to, you know, set that up again with all the extensive practical mm -hmm. effects on the people just like all the bullets that are raining everywhere it's actual practical effects they use these these fake bullets and these little mini fake projectiles called squibs and they only had so many takes throughout each day that they could do because it takes the entire day to set the beach up with all these squibs because the rain of fire is absurd with all the machine guns on those hills and on those cliffs so i think they're probably i said i think i read somewhere between like three hundred thousand shots would be fired like a day they're firing off thousands and thousands of these squibs just for each of these shots and what happens when you run out of squibs you have to shut down for the day and re reapply those squibs and put new squibs in and also another great effect that they would do is um, obviously they're using guns that fire blanks only but they fix the triggers of their guns to to set off squibs on people or or enemies that were being shot at to make it seem like there's actually a bullet traveling from this gun to that person's chest. And that's how they capture the shots where, say, the camera's behind a soldier and they fire on uh, someone, an enemy uh, uh, further down the, sh the screen and it accurately ex explodes on their chest when they fire the gun. That's because it's actually remotely connected. So it's, it's a great special effect. And also on this beach, there are a ton of obstacles, uh, like the anti-tank and anti-boat uh, obstacles. And these are actually put in by the Nazis because they expected the Allied forces to arrive on the beach in high tide. Uh, and so they put all these obstacles under the water to destroy their boats as they went, made it to shore. But the Allied forces uh, decided to embark during low tide. And so the water had, had not risen above the obstacles. So that's why all these obstacles are actually visible on the sea. They're not like put there for the soldiers. They're put there to, they were put there to stop the boats. But ch since the Allies came at low tide, it was unexpected by, for the Nazis. And probably one of the most disturbing parts of this entire scene and sequence really is for the majority in the beginning while the Allied forces are storming the beaches and getting shot at, we never see the faces of the German officers or, or soldiers. We never really see like their eyes or anything. What we see is just glimpses of them in the distance if we can, or if not over the shoulder shots of them firing at the, at the Allied troops. So it's kind of like disturbing, mm. this disturbing like enemy where you can't even see them. You don't know where they are, just like the troops storming the beach. We have no idea where, they, where we're looking for. Most of the men that were sent out in D-Day were actually very inexperienced uh, soldiers in terms of combat. And the, the army did this on purpose because they wanted soldiers to arrive at the beach not, not feeling intense amounts of fear and horror without having the experience of understanding what the combat would have been would have been like so many of these soldiers they were just fresh off the boat just finished training in boot camp and this was their first moment of warfare and that's similar to to the german soldiers on the other side during this battle because a lot of them weren't actually highly trained nazis from germany on the day of D-Day when forces landed, Nazi leader Adolf Hitler was still sleeping. This guy was knocked out until noon. God knows what he was up to the night before. Shooting up heroin. And none of his uh, other, none of his generals or or high up officers 
dared enter his room to try to disturb him to ask for reinforcements because they needed to or send them themselves they needed it to come from uh, hitler as a command to send reinforcements and without these reinforcements all these crucial hours are lost in this battle which led to the fall of normandy by the nazis to the allied forces the thing about this battle is these most of these german officers and, and soldiers in this battle were weren't nazis like i said they weren't germans they were from uh, other countries, they may be Polish or Austrian or or even French themselves, and they were captured and forced to fight in the Nazi army. And that's why um, there's a scene when they finally get past the beach and they they have the other uh, soldiers um, at gunpoint. They're screaming to them and pleading with them not to kill them. They're not speaking German. They're speaking another language. They're I think, speaking Czech. Yeah, speaking Czech. So it's Czech Republic and. These people are just, again, forced to fight or die. This episode of Raiders of the Lost podcast is brought to you by our friends at MoviePosters.com. Use coupon code RAIDERS15 to get 15% off your order today just in time for the holiday season. If you love movies as much as us and want to decorate your house, your apartment, your bedroom, it's the best website to use, especially with our coupon code RAIDERS15 at checkout for 15% off your order. They have great designs, framing, backlight, canvas, even plaque designs. Again, Raiders 15 at checkout for 15% off your order from MoviePosters.com. In this opening scene, we follow three different perspectives. It's the perspective of the Allied forces, the perspective of the Nazis, and then the perspective of Captain Miller, played by Tom Hanks. And I think this was a, a, a career-defining role for Tom Hanks because, yes, he had proved his, his abilities as one of the greatest actors working, but... Uh, he hadn't done anything in terms of action or or wartime in any in any capacity, and to see him as a, a soldier in this film, I think the reason why it works so much is because Tom Hanks doesn't look like what you would expect the hardened captain of a company to look like. He looks just like a, a normal average guy, and we end up learning throughout the film that he was actually just a, a a public school teacher in real life, and I think that. Casting Tom Hanks with that everyman quality makes us relate to the soldiers more because they just look like us rather than movie star, chiseled, strong men. They're just a bunch of young guys and they aren't soldiers. They were they were drafted and put into the war and given a duty. You know, a month ago he was teaching school. And speaking of given a duty, this whole battle could be like a metaphor for this squad that's going to have to go off and find this private Ryan and, you know, you know Compared to the men that give the orders, these soldiers are fighting in this horrific battle. They don't know what's coming around every corner. They don't know what they're going to expect. Whereas their commanding officers are in no danger at all, and they're just giving orders. Yeah, and that begs the question, the main idea of the film is, why is this this squadron of a handful of soldiers have to sacrifice their lives to save one man? And what's the point of this mission and why save one man at the expense of others? The mission is saving Ryan becomes a way for the men to, to try and get their humanity back. Yeah, because I think uh, Sergeant Horvath, played by Tom Sizemore in the film, he says something like, maybe saving Private Ryan might be the only good thing that they do while they're in this war, mm -hmm. and that's the only thing they do that's worth good in the god-awful shitty mess that they're in. So, yes, and, and from their perspective, saving Private Ryan can get their humanity back, but also... It seems like a genuine sentiment to his mother and their family, but really the army and the United States government is doing it more for propaganda reasons. They really want to— It's a publicity move. Yeah, it's a publicity move. They want to be able to put a face on this war to humanize it, to boost morale, and what better way to do it than this horrific story of this family and this mother who's lost so many sons to this war, but also you get this poster child for the war at the same time. Yeah, and then we learn through the reactions of, of the, the squad— uh, Obviously, Captain Miller is the leader because he does what he's told. He follows orders without question, even though his men question the orders. That's why they're not in charge of the company. He is because he is a leader because uh, he follows the chain of command and he does what his superiors tell him to do without question. So I think he shows strong leadership. And as we watch the scenes play out, we learn how good of a leader he is and how much his, his men respect him. Yeah, but again, however, when you look at the full context of their mission to save Private Ryan, why does Ryan's life matter over these men? Again, it's just because they want the image. The, the government cares more about the image than the families because, of course, all these men's lives matter. They all have families, too. They all have mothers. They all have probably siblings, some of them brothers, maybe brothers who have died in the war as well. But again, bringing Ryan home humanizes the war and death of what's going on. And also, I think it has something to to do about the loss of hope and 
how the idea that uh, one woman can lose five sons in a war is such a devastating prospect and can elicit uh, complete despair. And so I think saving, trying to save Private Ryan is a way of trying to hold on to hope in some way. And so I think it's actually a very important feat in endeavor for them to carry out. And ultimately, this film shows so many reasons why not to go to war, but also really the one reason to go to war, and that's because it's the only thing left to do, you know, when you're, it's the only option when you're left with this horrible enemy like Nazi Germany, you have to fight back before it's too late. Yeah, the the Germans were planning to completely overtake Western Europe if it wasn't for the Allied forces and the victories they had uh, during World War II. Uh, Nazi Germany would have occupied every country in Europe, and they would have become a serious threat to America. I'm sure that America was next on their list once they conquered Europe. And so this was uh, a very important war for the history of, of mankind and, and the survival of of all of these countries West in Western Europe and in North America. I think it's, uh, it's important to address that this film isn't perfect in terms of uh, the depiction of the soldiers uh, in World War II, especially in terms of uh, men of color who fought in World War II and sacrificed their lives for America and Western Europe's survival. Uh, over 1.2 million African-American soldiers fought for the Allied forces in World War II. And even though they all sacrificed themselves for the greater good, they were still facing uh, severe discrimination and segregation within every branch of the military, which is obviously very unfortunate, and you, you don't want to hear that. But it wasn't, it, I, and it actually wasn't until a civil rights movement where black soldiers began being treated better by the military. So I think it's important. Obviously, uh, I think the film missed the mark in terms of depicting people of color in these battles. I think one of the most important scenes in this film is also the squadron attack of that machine gun that they come across on the hill that doesn't see them when they're traveling to find Ryan. And I think it's important because Captain Miller's men ask, uh, I think it's important because Captain Miller decides that he and his men should take it out. Because That's they, not part of the mission. They don't have to. Yeah, so it's not part of the mission, but he thinks they should take it out because they can't just leave it for the next patrol to be ambushed. And obviously all of, all of his soldiers are upset about it because it's not part of their mission. It's it, Their mission is to find Ryan. Why not just leave it? Why not put this other obstacle in front of them? And for me, when I watch this, this to me is it's a form of protest of these soldiers against their commanding officers and their generals because this is the only time probably in the entire war that they get a choice in what to do and they get a choice to do something good by stopping this trap that's just waiting for the next patrol to come along and so they get instead of being told what to do they get to get the upper hand they are they're in control of their lives for a change and they get to take this out which to them is a win probably the only win they'll have in the entire war although the, it does come at a cost yeah i think uh giovanni Rabisi's character i can't remember what his name is but I think he has one of the, the most tragic deaths in, in the history of film just to, I think it was so accurate to see how this, how he portrayed death and how it was captured because we see people die in movies a thousand times, but it's rarely super believable. It's always like the same, like, uh, last words. And, uh. But with Herbisi, he did such a good job of, of portraying the fear of death. Like he's on the edge of, he's on the edge and precipice of death Mama. and and he's begging for his mom. And and he was he's resorted back to that childlike innocence that he recalled in that story, talking about his mother when she came home. He would pretend he was sleeping, and he regretted doing that. And you really connect with the character when he begins begging for not not begging for his life, but he's begging to see his mom again. And he's frightened like a little child. And I think that it's it's one of the most moving deaths in hi in the history of film. And the scene also has. A very important movie, a very important moment for later on, where they capture uh, one of the Nazis. They have him blindfolded, and uh, Corporal Upham, who's the translator, he's like the very cowardly, um, yeah. weak man who's not supposed to be there. He's a new part of the company. Yeah, yeah, he's not meant for war. He's like chatting him up because you know he's a good person and you know he sees the best in everybody, which is also a character flaw. Yeah, he um, convinces them that they should let him go and spare him and show him mercy, which. Again, is it worth showing? It, they do show humanity by giving this man mercy, but to what extent? Because this man later comes back to 
kill one of their own and, and attack Several. their own. Yeah. And yeah. so this man is responsible later on for for killing another character with that intense, slow stabbing scene in in the final climax of the movie. He also kills Miller at the end. He shoots. He's the he causes the uh, the the fatal wound. And then, you know, look at that on, on a massive scale. Is it worth showing mercy to a hostile and dangerous country only for them to cause more death and destroy another country later? So this is kind of like that dilemma and conundrum that a lot of countries go through when they're contemplating war, uh, hesitating to go to war, or end up choosing to go to war. And war puts difficult decisions on on the the lives and minds of people, and and I think that uh, nobody can prepare themselves fully for for encountering these kinds of situations. And I think that uh, Spielberg did a great job of uh, depicting death, not just in that scene, but also in the scene where Carpazzo, Vin Diesel's character, is killed by the sniper, where once again um, a character is trying to do something morally right by um, taking the girl from the family in order to bring her to safety. And even though Captain Miller's telling him not to, Carpazzo is reminded by his own niece when he sees the girl, so he wants to just do what's best for her and protect her and doing this thing that is obviously morally morally right and sound it leads to his own death so in times of war uh, you kind of have to be become morally ambiguous and you have to set aside feelings and, and emotions you might have and you have to follow orders strictly or it could mean your life because nobody saw his death coming and it just snuck up on everyone and then they find private ryan who refuses to go home and decides that he wants to stay and fight with his fellow men and his soldiers and the ironic thing about casting Matt Damon in this role is that Spielberg wanted like a a all-American looking guy who's young he's an actor but not really well known and then ironically overnight Matt Damon before this film came out shot to start him with Goodwill Hunting winning best screenplay and being such a, a critically acclaimed film so he ended up being one of the major draws to the movie and Matt's great in this movie obviously but I mean what must be going through this guy's head as a character where he never wanted his brothers to die he never wanted to go to war but he also didn't want anyone to come and rescue him and maybe not think that he was worthy to be there and stand alongside his fellow soldiers in his, in his squad yeah and he showed a uh, great great character in terms of um compared to when they they, they told the wrong Private Ryan uh, before this about the death of the brothers. That Ryan just broke down in tears and became like a pool of tragedy and, and despair. Whereas when this Ryan is told, obviously he's emotionally devastated, but he still has strong character and is able to, to overcome the news. And he understands that even though something horrible has happened in his life, he he's in, a, in an area and in a situation and environment where he can't afford to be emotional and he has to stick with his friends and, and his brothers and he has to continue serving his country. And that's why he refuses because he is, he has developed a strong bond with these other soldiers. Obviously we don't see what happened before the company gets there, but you can tell that these guys have been there for a while and obviously probably been serving together for a long time. So they become probably a family and he doesn't want to abandon his brother's and it, he doesn't think it's fair that he should live while everyone else should die. And so I think that Ryan shows a lot of the, uh, the best in us as a character. And one of the one of my favorite scenes with, with Matt Damon is the scene in which he and Captain Miller are chatting. And they're waiting for the Germans to arrive. And uh, Private Ryan tells that story. It's a little monologue about the last night with his brothers before they were shipped off to war. And... Uh, it's a cute little anecdotal story about their older brother trying to get laid and they were messing with them. And that story was actually completely improvised by Matt Damon in the scene and ad-libbed. And it was not written in the script. It had no plan for it. He just suggested, hey, can I say some, a story that I had an idea for? He, Spielberg let him say it. And it, it worked out so well that Spielberg kept it in the film. And so what happens is both these squads... Very few men stay to defend, I think it's the bridge, right? Because mm -hmm. the Germans are coming, and if they let the Germans take over this bridge, it leads them to the next city over to attack uh, where the Allied forces are. And so, and they get control. And so, 
they obviously kind of go into this suicide mission almost of trying to defend this small area with just a few men. So it's an awesome battle. It's an awesome team where they have like these booby trap explosions and everything. And obviously they're outnumbered. But then we also get um, where Corporal Upham helped lead to the mercy and freedom of that Nazi Nazi soldier. And Corporal Upham's played by Jeremy Davis in... Um, Throughout this whole film, he's obviously looked at as a coward. He acts like a coward. He he doesn't do his job very well in terms of being a soldier. Pacifist. Uh, yeah, so he obviously you can look at him as a coward. He's too afraid to help his friend when he's being attacked, when he could easily help. Um, and we have that intense scene where, he, like I said, he's at the bottom of the stairs crying while his friend's being killed by a Nazi, and he could easily go up there to help, but he decides not to. And we find out it's the same man that he helped let go, and so the Nazi lets him go. And then... Um, I think Corporal Upham probably goes through the most character tra- character transformation in this film because eventually he kills this German at the end of the film after they win the battle and they take he has them at gunpoint. He shoots this one he German. Executes him, he yeah. executes him in front of the other men. And I think that he does this because he's trying to relieve himself of his guilt of being such a coward for letting the Germans kill his fellow soldiers. And he'd rather live with the grief and pain of becoming a killer than letting that go unpunished we were young when we saw this movie for the first few times and when i first saw this film i always thought extremely negatively of up him and i still do obviously he's not he's not a strong person but you have to understand that a lot of these men who were sent to war they were kids they were 18 years old and they had no experience at all and they were thrown into this war zone and i mean just imagine Upham, a few months previous, was probably just in high school. You know what I mean? So you have to understand that I know so many films in the past, so many films about war, uh, the actors are are generally cast um, to play younger people, but they look like they're in their 30s and 40s. I think Dunkirk's the only one that did a good job. Yeah, Dunkirk, 1917 did a good job too. But yeah. So we so, we were so used to all these previous war films casting older actors to play the soldiers that we— we we forgot about the the fact that the vast majority of soldiers were under twenty years old, and so they were just kids. And you have to understand that when you're 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 so young, to obviously some people they won't be able to handle the stress of being in warfare. Some people aren't meant to be in that kind of situation. And I think Upham is just that kind of person who they're not supposed to be there. Saving Private Ryan is an incredibly powerful and philosophical film about war. There's so many moments in this movie that are, are more than just violence. Obviously, it's heavy in that, heavy in gore, but that violence, obviously, as we've talked about, represents much more. And we could go into two hours in this film, but yeah, yeah. but let's do some fun facts real quick. So Tom Sizemore, who played Harvath, I think this is his best role in his career. He was actually struggling with a drug addiction before the filming of this movie, and Spielberg forced him to take a drug test every day. And he, he really wanted Sizemore for this role because, obviously, he's perfect as as Harvath. And Spielberg said that if he failed a single test, he would recast the role and reshoot all of the scenes with a different actor. And ultimately, Tom Sizemore stayed clean and ended up giving one of the best performances of, performances of the film. Steven Spielberg is on record saying that even if the film had to receive an NC-17 rating, he would have released it uncut anyways. There are actually a few countries um, who... India and a couple of other countries, they didn't want to release that cut, and they asked him to change the cut of the film and make it less violent, and he refused for every situation. And a few of the films didn't show the, a few of the countries never showed the film. And then India is a is a country that, um, they're actually their one of their highest um, people in power and government watched the film and approved of it. And so obviously Spielberg stuck to his guns. This film is. I, one of the, my favorite things about this film is that it's got this crazy cast of supporting actors in like these very tiny, minor roles in the film. Uh, it happens a lot more when we. Yeah, so you have Vin Diesel, uh, you have Brian Cranston shows up, Paul Giamatti's in a scene, Nathan Fillion plays the other Private Ryan, Ted Danson's in a scene, and then Andrew Scott is in the scene as well. So this amazing cast of actors, and they're in a couple minutes each of screen time, if that. It's a, and some of them are like, like blink and you miss it roles. So it's a great cast. And the uh, the main cast of the film, they went through boot camp together. And Spielberg purposely uh, 
left Matt Damon out of the boot camp because he wanted the other actors to go through it together, knowing that Matt Damon didn't do it with them. To in that way, they would all form a kind of resentment towards Matt Damon, which he hoped would reflect on camera in their performances because they resented Private Ryan because of the mission they were on. Next up, 1917, which was released in 2019. Written and directed by Sam Mendes, also co-written by Christy Wilson Cairns. This film stars Dean Charles Chapman, George McKay, Daniel Mays, Colin Firth, Benedict Cumberbatch, and Andrew Scott. This film had a budget of $95 million and had a worldwide box office of $384 million. In 1917, during World War I, two brave soldiers crossed deep into enemy territory to deliver a message that could save 1,600 fellow men from walking into a deadly trap. This is one of, my, one of my favorite films of 2019, and it's become one of my favorite war films. And, and Sam Mendes crafted this incredible piece of cinema. And I know the one-take film has become kind of, the people judge it as a gimmick in a, in a lot of ways, but I think it works so well in this film because Sam Mendes and Roger Deakins, who, who shot the film as a cinematographer, they crafted it to, to appear as one take in order to demonstrate what it was like as a soldier where you didn't have a, a minute to yourself. You, you you were always in danger, and and it and the war never stopped. It never paused. So it put us into the shoes of these characters to to really feel the real time effects of warfare, like no film had ever done before. Yeah, it's one of my best. It's one of the best films of the decade. It's expertly made. Seemed to try to accomplish for World War One, World War One, what Saving Private Ryan did for World War Two, and what Platoon did for Vietnam by showing like the actual destruction and carnage of warfare in a realistic way and they did a great job with this supposed one take which is actually made up of, of us i think it's 39 different 48, shots for there are 48 edits in the film 48 edits and then i think the the longest take in the entire film is an eight and a half minute shot and the shortest take is about 40 seconds something like that yeah and all the edits are are they're hidden so when a character when the characters enter the trenches and it's dark for a couple of moments they're doing a cut right there um they're obviously CGIing and blending images together to cut them together and then whenever the the characters walk through an obstacle and the camera is on the other side of an obstacle like say a trench or a hill they're doing a cut right there and so they blended together all these shots and cuts to make it an invisible seamless one take yes exactly what they did with Birdman mm -hmm. so they make the entire film look like one take and I don't think we spoke for like 10 minutes after walking out of the theater when we saw this movie. Yeah. It had that kind of an emotional effect on me. And I've so, I've read some ridiculously critical reviews of this film. Again, people thinking that the one takes a gimmick. There's no storyline. There's no character development. But yeah, of course the story and characters you can say are limited, but we're mostly following around one soldier who's learning everything as he's going on. To me, that's the beauty of realism in, in film. It's just like Corporal's Blake and Schofield, we're learning on, of this mission at the very beginning, just like they're learning about this mission. We don't know where it's going to take us. They don't know where it's going to take them as we traverse the war-torn French countryside. So I don't understand that criticism because, I mean, what kind of storyline do you want between these two characters who are on this almost suicidal mission that they don't know what's going to happen around every corner? I've read the same things, and it doesn't make sense to me because I don't care about – I don't want to know – where these guys are from and what their lives are like before within the first 10 minutes of this movie. I think that Sam Mendes was so smart about how he wrote this where he just puts you right into the action. And most of these men didn't know each other. Yeah. They met that day. They met yeah. that week. They they met at the mess hall. People were literally met. put into into platoons and put into, put into squadrons right away and, and given orders to, to join a company and they don't know anyone. And also you do learn about the characters as the film progresses and I think that you actually learn a lot about them, especially uh, Schofield, who we end up following throughout the course of the film. So I think that's a, a, a incorrect critique on the film. And I think people are being a little too hard on it. And they're not also not understanding uh, Sam Mendes' intention with the film is to put you in the into the shoes and the boots, in so other words, of of what it's like to to be put on a mission. And it's not just telling the story of these two soldiers, which is based on a true story about Sam and his grandfather who served in World War One and actually went on this mission. It's making you feel like you were on the mission by filming it in real time and not cutting it. It makes you feel like you're actually going on, you're, you're following right behind these two guys. And I had never been in a theater and watched a film where I really felt like I was right there with the characters in the scene. It felt like 
the closest thing to a VR experience for me. Yeah, and I felt like I related very well with both the characters. Uh, Dean Charles Chapman plays Blake, who's this like heartbreaking optimist who obviously suffers, spoilers alert, a horrifying death. Um, he's kind of like this young daydreamer. He's, he's always upbeat and seems to be he's very just, charming. He's like yeah. a kind of a joker and he's mm. the most optimistic person in World War One, maybe. And then Schofield played by George McKay. He's a lot more quiet. He's more reserved. Um, I think they talk about how he fought in the Battle of Somme in previously in the mm-hmm. war, which was, I think, one of the most horrifically bloody battles in world war one i think a million people died at it yeah so he has a battlefield experience and blake has no real combat experience and i think that this film is brilliant because right away the first image we see of these two characters actually uh, perfectly uh, parallels the final images in the film so the film opens with uh schofield sitting against the tree and then blake is lying in the grass nearby and then for each of their stories, they end in the same way where Blake, Blake's final image is him lying in the grass dead. And Schofield's last image is him sitting against a tree looking at photos of his family. And so Man- Mendez and Deacon's perfectly paralleled bookends for each character in their, pos- in their physicality and the images of their, of their uh, storylines. And my God, Sam Mendes puts you on a journey with these two young uh, soldiers, especially as it starts off and they get on this mission where they have to try to prevent this trap. So German forces uh, withdrew from a a position uh, several miles away. And initially, the the British forces thought that they were retreating. But in reality, the the Germans were um, committing a a strategic withdrawal and joining more forces. And they were going to ambush the British forces who were planning to attack them because the British forces thought they were, they were running away. So they're like, okay, we got them on their heels. Let's go after them. But in fact, the Germans were gaining in numbers while this was happening. And so uh, these two soldiers are sent on a mission by the general to, to deliver the message to the colonel that it's all an ambush and and that if this, this um, attack is carried out by the British forces, they're all going to die. And it opens up with them walking through all these trenches and getting these commands and then trying to figure out where to go. And I've always been fascinated with trenches and wars because it's obviously a place of almost safety for soldiers. It's kind of like their temporary home and their their one place to actually catch a breath. And mm-hmm. they built, I think, 5,800 feet of of uh, trenches, just like just under a mile of trenches for these shots and for these scenes. And it's an incredible, obviously, long take of walking through those trenches and getting the different types of men that are in there. And they end up reaching the the soldiers at the end of the trench, uh, led by Andrew Scott, who don't even know what day it is. They don't know what time it is. They've yeah. been there for who knows long. They lost count of how many days because they're at the front lines of, of no man's land, which is ahead of them. Yeah, and, obviously, and previously in films, a lot of films that involve trenches – there are actually still historical sites of the actual trenches throughout Europe, and oftentimes film productions will use those sets and film inside of those. But for this film, since it was shot in the specific way of using long one-takes, they built the trenches for the, the purpose that uh, each scene, uh, for example, moving through the trenches, they filmed in one take, nine, eight, seven-minute scenes, and uh, they perfectly choreographed their dialogue along with the physicality of how they moved through the scenes. And it all had to work timing-wise perfectly so that they hit the same spot at, at every moment for each take. There could be never, there could be no digression. And so the every trench set was built to a specific length with specific markers for each part of the dialogue. So the, the, the lengths of the trenches attributed to the, the actual dialogue that was happening between the characters. And the imagery and the production design of this film are sensational, and it makes you feel like Every place we go to with these two soldiers, there was just a war there. There was just a battle. There was just a, an entire regime. Re, there's an entire regiment of soldiers, of Nazi soldiers. There was just death. There was destruction. It seems so realistic. And I think the production design of this of this movie should be properly appreciated for the work that they put in. And then we have that amazing scene in the mine shaft. And this movie is kind of like Lord of the Rings in a way because it's these two people on a quest. And then uh, obviously the the mines of Moria and the mines of this Nazi German encampment. And uh, I think that's one of the most tense scenes I've ever seen is when they accidentally set off those bombs inside the uh, mine shaft and they have to mm-hmm. escape and get out. And The mouse sets it off. Yeah, the mouse. And uh, Schofield's blinded and they have to jump across the hole. And it, this whole film is just full of intense moment after intense moment and they're all unique and it just keeps you 
emotionally drained and excited the entire film. Yeah, it's it's uh, obstacle after obstacle, and I love that that mine shaft scene as well because Schofield's blind and and he has to jump over that hole without knowing it's there, and and Blake he has to trust Blake's words, and they do finally get out. Schofield owes him his life, and Blake saved him. But right after this, we get that tragic scene where they reach that farmhouse, and it's a quiet moment, and, and Schofield's getting the milk, and and Blake finds some food in the in the farmhouse, and then all of a sudden there's a dogfight above them, and and a German plane gets hit, and, and and crash lands near the farmhouse, and it's it's very similar to Saving Private Ryan, where where the two British soldiers they go to try to save the German soldier who's burning inside of his aircraft. And they pull the German out of the plane, and they they bat away the flames, and they've saved his life. And and then Schofield is, is even going so far as to, to he's looking for his water canteen. And when he turns around, the the German has stabbed Blake several times in his in his in his torso. And Schofield has to shoot the German right away. And we get this tragic scene where you you expected these two characters to carry out the film together. That's what my expectation was. Mm-hmm. And to see Blake die within 30 minutes was very shocking and surprising and, and really, honestly, devastating. And one of the saddest parts of that is before that scene, I think it was right when they come out of the mine after mm-hmm. the explosion, Schofield is, like, screaming and getting into an argument with Blake. Like, why did you pick me? Why did you choose me? Because uh, Blake was tasked with choosing another person to come with him. He didn't know what they were signing them up for. He just was told to pick somebody and come with me. Yeah. And so he had no idea what he was signing him and Schofield up for. And then, obviously, Blake is the one who dies. It's kind of ironic how Blake ended up dying and Schofield survived. Yeah, and the reason why Blake was given the mission is because his brother is part of the British forces that's going to get ambushed. So he has been... The the general chose him because he has an incentive to save his brother. And so another soldier might not try as hard to get through, but Blake wants to save his brother, so that's why he was selected for this. And then he just randomly picked Schofield because... He was next to him, and they had uh, a mild like friendship beforehand. And then Schofield, even though he didn't want to carry out this mission because of Blake's death, he can't help but carry it on his on his shoulders and and finish it off and see it to the end. Yeah, it's uh, you're right. It's a big turning point for Schofield where he he feels indebted and that he has to carry this out. And I I love how they transition from this where Mark Strong and his outfit of of soldiers are passing through and they they pick him up on a truck. And it, it, Sam Mendes is so patient with this filmmaking here where, where, where Schofield is just sitting with these other soldiers uh, traveling through the, the landscape on these trucks. And yes, the whole film is in, is, uh, appears to be in one take, but there is an instance right after this where after Schofield encounters a sniper and he's, uh, he, he kills a sniper, but he himself is knocked unconscious and he passes out. And when he wakes up, it's nighttime. So that is the one instance where it's still technically one take, but uh, this is the first instance where it's not real time anymore. Yeah, and then we have this beautiful sequence where um, we do get a glimpse of humanity for a little bit where he, he is being chased by Germans and he ends up hiding in a basement. He breaks through a window and he finds this young mother in a, in a newborn baby. And we do get a glimpse of, of morality for, for a change of pace in the film. And it's a warm scene and it's touching and emotional. And of course, he has that milk that he got from the dairy farm for the, for the infant. And um, the mother's obviously begging for him to stay, but he has to go because those Nazis are looking for him. And this scene actually is more significant the second time you watch this film because uh, you don't find out until the end of the movie that Schofield himself has a wife and two kids. It resonates more with uh, an emotional impact the second time you watch the scene because uh, Schofield encountering a mother and and her infant uh, is really important to him and has an emotional and profound effect on him because he himself is a father. And so I think it's a, a powerful moment for, for the character and also a moment of levity for the film to, to take a break for a second and to just remember what we're fighting for. And I want to wait until this scene to talk about um, both Thomas Newman and his beautiful score in this film, especially the scene, The Night Window, with that song yeah. when, he's, when he's running away. And also Roger Deakins, who probably the greatest cinematographer living today. If not, he retires. He might be the best ever. Um, he's up there, top three all time for sure. And this movie is nothing but a work of art by him. And particularly this scene where he's running in the dark through this town that's been destroyed and it's being lit up by flares because the Germans are throwing them into the air. And 
uh, the flares were actually controlled on wires so they could actually control where the lighting was moving to and from. And Thomas Newman scores is playing while we're, while Schofield's running, and he ends up running at this church that's on fire and burning down, this enor- enormous church. And the way they shot this was they actually built this enormous light structure that had 2,000 tungsten lamps. It was a total of 2 megawatts, and they created this enormous glowing effect of just pure bright light and it's beautiful but haunting at the same time because they actually afterwards they put in post this burning church over this light but it creates this real practical glow coming in front of Schofield and coming into the lens and coming to the audience and it's so bright and it's one of the most beautiful shots I've ever seen in a war film yeah Deacons actually did the same thing in Skyfall at the climax of the film when uh, Javier Bardem's character is chasing Judy Dench through the through the property, and then the mansion is burning behind him. They did the same thing where they built this giant light tower, and then they CGI the actual building itself. But it creates this uh, realistic and authentic uh, warm light that the fires would really create. This scene, the chase scene in this town, is is really brilliant because it also employed the long take structure where they didn't blend a bunch of cuts together. What they did was they they filmed this chase scene using uh, a few different methods where uh, they would shoot hand. It was, it was a, a handheld steady cam operator following uh, Schofield, and then he transferred to a, a guy on a motorbike who then who filmed while a person drove the motorbike to catch up with them running, and then they transferred to another person who held it on the steady steady cam, and then it transferred to a crane. And so this is an instance where they used uh, several different techniques and uh, uh, gaff and, and uh, gripping techniques and and filming techniques, and they combine them together into one sequence, which is a really brilliant way to, to film the scene. Obviously very complicated, but when you have someone like Sam Mendes and Deacons, you can pretty much do anything. In terms of the cinematography of this film, since they wanted it to all... Uh, they were Obviously they were filming a bunch of takes that they were meshing together, so they, they needed continuity in terms of the, the visual structure, as, structure and aesthetic of the, of the film itself, so... Uh, Pretty much the entire film was shot with uh, the same lens. It's a, a 40 millimeter lens. And then there was a, a couple scenes with a 35 mil um, in the trench with the Colin Firth. But otherwise, it's all a 40 millimeter lens. That adds to the adds to the continuity of the look of the film. And that's what leads to uh, seamless cutting when they have to do make cuts and mm-hmm. edits. And obviously, the film ends with Schofield making it to those other troops and warning them with getting to their lead commander played by Benedict Cumberbatch and we have that very emotional scene where um, he's running up off the trenches in order to make it to those those officers because there's so many men in the way and yeah and uh it's it's a really intense scene because there are men chasing going to war at the same time as him running uh perp- running perpendicular to them to get to the officers to stop the attack and yeah. stop the assault and there's explosions going off and mortars going off near him and bullets and he's bumping into people and he's bumping into his other British soldiers which was was not planned at all what's really fascinating about the scene is um they employed the same technique of using several different people filming and transferring the camera amongst amongst each other during the scene and in fact the the scene starts out with uh, the camera on a crane on a truck and then as George McKay is running the, the truck is driving ahead of him. And then two cameramen actually dressed in wartime attire. And they're part of the people that are running. They run, on, they're on camera and they run past the camera. And then while they're off screen, what they're doing is they're actually taking the camera off the crane. And then they the truck drives away and they're carrying the camera leading George McKay from then on. So it's an amazing effect of they literally are in character wardrobe and then they become the cameramen in the scene. And he gets inside to the officers and he, the commanding officer played by Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch and obviously they don't believe him at first but then they actually end up calling off the fight and believe him that it's an ambush and it's a trap and Cumberbatch's character has some great dialogue. He says this one line where there's only one way this war ends, last man standing. And he also kind of hints that it doesn't matter the orders he was just given to stop this attack because... Those are the orders he gets today. He'll get some other ones in a couple of days that will say the exact opposite, and, and he just kind of has to do what he says. Because, But to him, it doesn't really matter if they attack today or tomorrow. Yeah, he's reluctant to call off the attack, and then when he finally does, like you said, he's someone who, through his experience, he understands that, like, yeah, we may have saved lives in this day, but 
these men are they can die tomorrow. So in the in the scheme of things of wartime, uh, people are gonna die. And yes, this is a a, a just cause in the moment, but uh, there's tomorrow we're gonna attack someone, and the next day we're gonna attack someone. So in the in the long run, it doesn't matter. So obviously he he is reluctant to carry out his own his orders. And then Schofield finds Blake's brother, played by Richard Madden, and um, tells him about what happened to Blake and how good of a person he was. And it's a really emotional scene. And and then he ends the film, uh, like you said earlier, it's a bookend where he goes to sit up against that tree and he holds out the photo of his family. This is where we finally learn that he has, he has a wife and kids. And I'm getting emotional thinking about it right now. This, this film left me devastated because uh, in this scene, in the final scene, Schofield uh, travels through uh, the encampments where injured soldiers and, and dead soldiers are, are 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 laying, and he's he's we're seeing the not just deaths but the extreme uh, casual the extreme effects of war on on men and the amount of suffering so many men have gone through and so many have sacrificed for the greater good of their countries and and for freedom and. I think it was just one of the most powerful scenes I've seen in, in a war film, and it made it really made you feel grateful for for the men who who sacrificed their lives, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of men over the wars of the past couple hundreds of years, uh, who really uh, we are where we are today because of their sacrifice, and it made me really cherish and and really uh, feel grateful for that. Next up, we have Fury. Written and directed by David Ayer, released October 17th, 2014. This film stars Brad Pitt, Shia LaBeouf, Logan Lerman, Michael Pena, and John Bernthal. This film grossed $211 million worldwide on a budget of $68 million. In the depths of war, Sergeant Don War Daddy Collier leads five men into a deadly mission behind enemy lines. As they move to strike the heart of Nazi Germany, the team is outgunned, outnumbered, and afflicted with inexperienced soldiers. Fury is dark, wet, and cold, and that's what David Ayer wanted. It seems like the sun doesn't shine in this entire film when you watch it. It seems to be always either nighttime or overcast. And obviously this film has a lot of similarities to Saving Private Ryan, but at this point, what more movie made in the 21st century doesn't? And it takes place over a period of just 24 hours, and it's an incredible cast led by Brad Pitt, who came back to kill Nazis with a different American accent. <laughs> Although Fury couldn't be much, couldn't be more different than Inglorious Bastards, and it follows this tank crew, which seems to be a great idea and and set for and setting for telling a story of camaraderie and brotherhood in war, because it's like this micro environment, this micro world where. They're living inside this giant vehicle that's a, a massive weapon of war, but also a, a refuge and, and form of safety at the same time. It's a it's a great story about family and being accepted into a family. And Logan Lerman's character, Norman, essentially starts out as an ad, outsider, and then he eventually is welcomed and accepted by these men as part of their brotherhood. And this film takes place in a, a very specific time of, of war in, in World War II where... Uh, the Nazis were on their heels, and the Allied forces were had taken control of most or, most of Europe, and now they were attacking Nazi Germany itself. And so, uh, obviously, the Germans were were losing the war. And this actually takes place in the final weeks of World War II, where the, essentially the war was going to be over. Pretty much everyone knew the, knew it by then, um, but there was still a lot of fighting to do, and they still had to take control of Germany itself. So there's still some more work to be done. Yeah, Brad Pitt plays War Daddy, who's the commander of this tank crew. And like you just said, it takes place near the end. And he says in the film that he started this war killing Nazis in Africa, and now he's killing Nazis in Germany. So it's, again, it's near the end, but still the end is probably still probably the most violent because that's when uh, the German and Nazi soldiers were mo- most vulnerable. So, and again, we're talking about tanker crews and tank warfare, which the Nazis, one of their greatest weapons and probably the greatest weapon of the time were their tanks and their Panzer tanks and their the Tiger, Tiger tank. tanks. These were uh, advanced weaponry and they they could pretty much take on two or three Schofield American tanks at once and virtually uh, most British tanks, their their shells would just bounce right off their 
off the Panzer and Tiger tanks because their their armor was so much so much more advanced, and so it was not an easy task to take on these tanks. Yeah, and I think this is a like you said, it's a great idea for telling a, a war story, and I think this cast works so well together. Uh, they all have a specific duty uh, on the tank, and even though they couldn't be more different from one another, when they're fighting, they work as a, a perfect unit, and, and they understand each other so well. And I think uh, Air chose a, a great cast. In, in the opening scene, they lose one of their members, which is obviously very devastating to the team because they lost pretty much they lost their brother. They're very cold to Logan and Lerman's character, Norman, when he is assigned the tanker duty. And Norman is very similar to Upham in Saving Private Ryan, where he has no combat experience, and he's he's thrust into this tanker squad, having no idea how to even fire the gun he's assigned to. So he's another person who was just a, a, a teenage kid a few months before, and now he's part of a tanker unit in Nazi Germany. Yeah, just like Upham, he represents basically the corruption of innocence and humanity in war. Um, he Again, he probably comes across as a coward at first, not as bad as Upham, but he doesn't do his job uh, during the first battle he's in. He doesn't fire his gun when he could, and it ends up resulting in the explosion and death of another tank crew um, and commander. And so War Daddy basically chews him out in this, in this intense scene where he forces Norman to kill somebody. He forces Norman to kill a prisoner by holding him down, holding a gun in Norman's hand and using Norman's hand and finger to pull the trigger to, to kill a Nazi prisoner. And this is basically his initiation for Norman into the tank crew, into the war. Yeah, and War Daddy does this because Norman doesn't understand that this is no time for, for morality and there's, this is no time for, for honor and, and for turning the other cheek. These these enemies they have to be killed because like for example in Saving Private Ryan every soldier you spare can be a gun that goes up against you again, and War Daddy's trying to teach this to Norman that we're here to kill and you have to get used to it. You're not gonna be able to steer your way around killing people. Uh, this is this is your your duty. This is your duty now. Norman learned first that failing to act costs the deaths of the other American soldiers, and then he learns. From this, uh, from being forced to execute this man, that uh, killing is a necessary part of warfare, and there's no avoiding it. And he does his job next time around, the next fight, and next battle, and he he does pull the trigger and he does kill and helps win, helps them win, and he eventually, towards the end of the film, becomes completely corrupted by war. Um, but he is turned into a killer, and he is starting to be accepted into the crew. And um, Shia LaBeouf is is awesome in this movie, and his commitment to roles is intense. And for this film. According to him, this is what he did. After the day he got the job, he joined the U.S. National Guard. He was baptized, accepted Christ into his heart, tattooed his surrender, and became a chaplain's assistant to Captain Yates for the 41st Infantry. He spent a month living on a forward operating base. Then he linked up with the cast and went to Fort Irwin. He pulled out his tooth, knifed up his face to make it seem real because it was real, and spent days watching horses die. And he also didn't bathe for four months during production. He must have stank. So he, he goes intense on his commitment to roles, and you take that how you want. David Ayer also had the, the actors, the, the leading five actors, uh, fight each other on set uh, during, t- during breaks as a way to, to build their camaraderie, and he would literally have them fight and wrestle each other. And just like in uh, 1917, we do get a few moments of, of almost humanity in this movie where they're in that small German town, and um, War Daddy takes... Norman up to that apartment. They find that apartment with the the two women inside of it, and this shows, I think, a a, a lot of character background of War Daddy because it seems like it seems like he has a family, or maybe had a family. He has kids, maybe he has a wife back home, but he probably hasn't seen them in a long time because he's been at war for so long. He even hints that he's been around fighting since World War One, and um, he kind of s- tries to play house here. He sort of tries to to act like a husband, sort of, or seem like he's a normal man for a little bit. But um, despite him being a, a ruthless killer, he still does show some display of morality where he doesn't take advantage of these women. He doesn't uh, try to to force himself onto them. Um, but we do get that very cute relationship between Norman and the, and the young German girl in that apartment. Yeah, and I think uh, War Daddy is just looking for a moment of normalcy. Like he shaves his face nice and clean and... 
he sits down at the table and he's reading a paper. And I think he just wants to experience something normal for just a moment. And there is actually a deleted scene where we learn more about his character uh, that David Ayer had to delete for time constraints. And the, his backstory is that uh, when he was younger, he had gotten a he got drunk in while driving a car with his girlfriend and his brother in the car. He he drunkenly crashed the car and they were killed. And then he was burnt up. That's why his back has that intense. Uh, burn scars all over his back and after he was arrested he was given the option you can go to jail or you can die for your country in war and so he decided to go uh, go to war and he expected himself he he didn't expect himself to survive the war especially this long and if you look closely at the end of the film when after War Daddy's been killed. His uh, Norman goes into the tank to cover him with a jacket out of respect, and then he grabs War Daddy's pistol. And on the pistol handle, there is a, a the image of a, a woman, and it's his ex, it's his girlfriend who died. He he uh, taped her her photograph to the handle of his pistol. And the scene also gives us a complete juxtaposition of characters where the other men in their tanker crew come in, and you can tell that they're completely morally corrupt because they seem to the be. They, they seem like they're about to take advantage of the woman and kind of just overpower War Daddy and Norman, even though War Daddy is their commanding officer. It seems like they're about to just take the woman for themselves, no matter what War Daddy says. And if it isn't for the attack that they hear, forcing them to have to leave, it seems like they would have succeeded too. Yeah, I think that War Daddy understood that, yes, his these men are his brothers, but they have seemed to have lost all of their humanity and their decency. And so I think that's why he didn't invite them up to the house. And he knew that Norman still had a great amount of humanity and morality within him. And that's why he fit into the, the playing of normalcy along with war daddy. And obviously the other men are extremely jealous for not being invited up. And they even show that they, he was right there. They seem to be, to be very dangerous. And it's a horrible scene next where they leave the apartment building because they have to go fight. And then that building gets completely destroyed in front of them. And this is obviously that very emotional point for Norman. And also this is a point where Norman basically turns completely, complete character transformation into a ruthless killer now. Because in the next battle, he is screaming at the top of his lungs. He is pulling the trigger as hard as he can. He's trying to kill as many Nazis as he can for revenge on what happened to his, uh, his uh, day-long girlfriend. <laughs> day long girlfriend. if that yeah he's he's essentially been desensitized by warfare and he he's been stripped of his humanity and now he has become a hardened soldier and it's amazing because wartime is such a, a horrible thing that it happens so quickly it only took a matter of days to turn this this innocent naive young boy into into a killer a, a ruthless killer at that and that's what happens in warfare is is, is innocent men lose their lose their innocence and they lose their morality and they become killing machines. I think the greatest strength of this film is the cinematography by Ronan Vazianov, who's been doing all of Ayer's films since End of Watch. And I think it's a true skill, just like in Saving Private Ryan and in 1917 for a cinematographer to be able to take something as devastating as war and make it look beautiful at the same time. And I think this film does a great job. We get a lot of really cool, interesting shots and, and lighting, and it's, it's actually very beautiful. But I think if there's a con to this film, it's probably a little bit of the storyline and, and probably the characters seem a little thin. I mean, they're all good and they're all fun and they're all unique, but also they seem kind of just have one character trait about them. That's about it. Um, and sort of cliched at times, but they're, it's a very well acted though. I'll give them that. Yeah, it's a great cast. And I think that something that this film showed that Ayer put into the film is he, he really showed a, uh, the, the idea of the Hitler youth where um, at the end of the war, because he was so desperate, Hitler uh, assigned new battalions of, of young boys, like little kids, like 10, 11, 12-year-old boys, and they became soldiers. And there are two instances where we see Hitler youth in this film, and they were pretty common at this time in the war. And even though they were young young kids, they, they, were, they posed a real serious threat to Allied forces, and they honestly, most of the time, they had to be killed out of uh, the threat of their own lives. We have a great climax that's similar to Saving Private Ryan, where it's basically uh, they're up against insurmountable odds. It's five men versus 300. Um, it's obviously a little far-fetched that they, they uh, 
do as well as they do. But it's based loosely on a true story where there were um, a couple of tanks that survived against uh, an onslaught of other German uh, forces. But um, it's a great climax. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and everyone dies except for Norman. And we do get a glimpse, at, again, at, at Nazi youth here, but maybe a character similar to Norman where Norman's hiding under the tank at the end of the battle, at the end of the fight. And a Nazi young soldier peeks out under peeks underneath the tank and sees Norman there, and instead of telling everyone that there's an allied, that, instead of telling everyone that there's an allied soldier under the tank, he doesn't say anything. He lets him go because I'm sure they're both dealing with the same thing. I'm sure they're both in a war they didn't want to be in, both fighting for something that they didn't want to fight for. Also, to piggyback off of that, the sniper who shot War Daddy and inflicted him with the the fatal wound, that sniper is actually shows that we we see his face and he's actually an older man seems to be about brad pitt's age so i think that both those characters are parallels to norman and war daddy also a really cool fact about this is that michael pena's character gordo he has a wooden cross in this film and he actually used the same cross in the film the martian the one that he left on the base that uh what's matt damon's character's name mark watney that mark watney uh, sh- uh shaves to to create fires it's the exact same cross as the the cross in this film. The final film in the episode, Full Metal Jacket, which was released in 1987, directed by Stanley Kubrick, written by Stanley Kubrick, Michael Hare, and Gustav Hereford. This film stars Matthew Modine, Adam Baldwin, Vincent D'Onofrio, and R. Lee Emery. With a budget of $30 million, this film had a worldwide box office of $166 million. Stanley Kubrick's take on the Vietnam War follows Private Davis, a.k.a. Joker, and Private Lawrence, a.k.a. Private Pyle, as they endure the rigors of basic training. Though Pyle takes a frightening detour, Joker graduates to the Marines and is sent to Vietnam as a journalist, covering and eventually participating in the bloody Battle of Hue. Kubrick did something new with this film. He had actually, he has made war films in the past with... Uh, Paths to Glory and Dr. Strangelove, he did something completely unique again where we not only see warfare in this film, but we we see, I think, for the first time in a significant way in film, the, the preparation for war, where the first half of this film takes place at boot camp and the second half takes place in Vietnam. And during the boot camp storyline, we're, we're shown the true extent of what it takes to, to turn uh, young men into killing machines and, and the trials that they go through uh, while being trained um, in the art of warfare. And I think it's uh, the definitive uh, showcase for uh, boot camp and military training in film history. Yeah, when you think of film and boot camp uh, parts in film and sequences, you think of Full Metal Jacket, you think of Art Lee Emery screaming in, in uh, <laughs> recruits' faces. It's the most memorable basic training sequence in all of war films. It's It's interesting to see how militaries have to break down their recruits before they even go to war they have their own little wars and their own little battles before they even get there while they're at home or while they're on a base against these drill sergeants and and the reason why drill sergeants have to break down their recruits like this and and berate them and scream at them and even and uh, used to probably assault them is they had to get them ready for war they had to get them ready for the horrors of war to be able to react in war and to be able to essentially they're trying to turn them into desensitized killing machines Yeah, and also one of the main reasons also for this is because they had to take away the individuality of each person. And so if you take away the individual, they become part of a unit. And that's how you survive in warfare, and that's how you win battles is if your soldiers act as one and act as a unit and work work together for the greater good for the success of the unit rather than for themselves and their own survival. So by, by stripping away the individuality of each man, uh, it brings them closer to become a soldier, and this whole boot camp is about the take is about taking away each man's humanity and each each man's identity and individuality. And the film actually starts off with this by physically taking away their individuality by shaving their heads. And it's a, a really famous sequence in the opening of the film where uh, we get a great the same identical shot of each character as their heads are being shaved uh, before boot camp and. Uh, at first, they all obviously have much different hair, and they look very different different and unique from one another. But once all their heads are shaved, they've become very similar looking. They, they've they lost their identities in, in a major way by having their hair taken away. I think uh, just to keep going on that, like even even men of different races, they all seem to kind of look exactly the same. They have the same mm-hmm. look on their face. They've lost their individuality, like you're saying. 
you almost can't tell the difference between the black guys and the white guys because they all just look exactly the same now, like, now, like they're one entity. And it goes even further where the first things that uh, their drill instructor, Sergeant Hartman, is screaming at them is they're all equally worthless. Uh, he gives them nicknames instead of referring to them by their real names. We never even learn Joker's name, really. They just call him Joker. That's his character's name is Joker. And Hartman tells them that if they survive boot camp, they'll become weapons of death praying for war not even human beings anymore exactly and i think that hartman the drill sergeant is obviously uh, the most iconic character of this movie and uh, kubrick actually had another an actor in mind and arlie emery was arlie ermy was actually serving as a consultant on the film and for kubrick he carried out a few examples of what a drill sergeant would do and kubrick filmed these these uh, little playful scenes uh, as a reference guide, and he loved what Ermi was doing so much that he decided that Ermi would be perfect for the role as an actor, not just as a consultant. And so this is at Ermi's first acting credit, and he he had a, a a pretty good career. You've also seen him in Seven. He plays the the captain of the police force in Seven, and shares a few scenes with Brad Pitt and Morgan Freeman in that movie. And this obviously was a defining moment in his life, and he became an actor after this movie, but he actually was a real drill sergeant, and he was actually carrying out the kinds of things he would really do in real life in the military bases. Yeah, and I think they said he came with like hundreds of pages of obscene things to say that are in his head of things that he's already said to recruits and everything, and the actor who was originally going to play Hartman, he actually started, in, I think, in rehearsals, they were running through a scene, and after 30 minutes of screaming, he lost his voice, and he couldn't do it anymore. He's actually the guy in the chopper shooting at the innocent people. Yeah, holding the gun. Yeah, so yeah. that's actually the guy who was supposed to be Hartman, but he couldn't do it because you have to scream for basically a, like five weeks. Yeah, and you couldn't imagine anyone but Ermy doing this now. I mean, he, the, I think he's become the definitive idea for what a drill sergeant is to the general public. And the one thing that this movie uh, is a little fictitious about is that uh, yes, the drill sergeants and superior officers, they can get a little physical with their recruits and with their privates, but uh, uh, they they never take it too far. There are there have been obviously instances of, of drill sergeants uh, losing their tempers and taking things a little too far, but uh, I think this film makes it seem as though it's a common thing to really cause physical abuse to the recruits, but that's not entirely factually true. In this film, it's, it's not a typical three-act structure um, like most films and it's really kind of three separate short films kind of put together uh, with recurring characters mostly Joker is basically the main character throughout the whole film and it's I think it's obvious that Kubrick did this because there are three um, very noticeable fades in this movie which kind of ends one short story or one part of the film and begins the other and for example film one you could say ends after Pyle kills himself at Paris Island Film 2 starts in Vietnam on that busy street and ends with Animal Mother going into that building with the sex worker. And Film 3 starts with the destroyed Vietnam city that the troops are walking through. So he kind of just flipped the story structure on its head and just kind of did his own thing here. Yeah, and even though uh, Joker is essentially the lead in all these different, uh, in these three parts of the film, uh, the supporting actors are very strong forces in each in each part. And I think... Uh, obviously, in the in the boot camp scenes, it's it's uh, uh, Pyle and Hartman, and I think that that story is even though Joker is the lead, I think it's more so Pyle's story than anyone else's because with Pyle, he starts out as the the worst recruit there. He's just a lousy marine. He can't do anything physically correct. He can't he can't perform physically. He's constantly making mistakes and uh, forcing Hartman to punish the entire crew because of him, and he's also uh, sneaking snacks and Hartman catches him with a donut in his in his case, and so he he starts out as this uh, a horrible excuse for Marine, and throughout the physical and emotional and mental abuse he he sustains from Hartman, he becomes a hardened killer, and at it seems as though he might just be, it, it seems as though he might be succeeding as a as a Marine because he's becoming a good shot and. He's becoming adept at uh, constructing and deconstructing his rifle, and he's become very meticulous and clean in how he's living. But also, Joker is noticing that this could be suffering from a mental breakdown from the abuse he's been experiencing, and, and he's right. 
And so in, in a lot of these war films, we're dealing with this concept of the duality of man, which uh, Plato spoke about the, du- about the duality of man when it comes to the mind and matter, meaning that one part of man lives in his mind thinking and observing while another part moves and creates. And we're dealing with that concept here specifically with Private Pile because, like you said, he can't do anything right. He's always getting in trouble. And that jelly donut scene so famous where – um, his locker is unlocked, and then uh, Hartman searches and finds that jelly donut. And this is the a turning point for Pyle, specifically because this is where Hartman decides that every time Pyle messes up, he's going to punish the entire uh, squad for every mistake he made, which now turns everybody against Pyle, where that Pyle before this was kind of just a joke out of all the recruits, of all the corporals and it, it didn't lead to too much because he was just punishing himself. But now everything he does that messes up, it affects every other corporal in the squad. And before this, Pyle was paired up with Joker because Joker seemed to be able to kind of help him stay keep pace with everything. And and Joker kind of takes on this this image or this role of like a mother to Private Pyle because if you watch this movie again, look, watch Private Pyle. He acts like a child. He can't even tie the laces to his boots. He can't even do anything without joker's help and so you could say that the duality of man where he's being shaped both obviously by hartman and maybe hartman's this like father daddy figure for him where joker's the mother but hartman's giving him the side of of humanity where it's it's pure killing and rage and and fighting and whereas he's kind of getting this human side from joker that's a little more understanding and even sarcastic and fun at times so he's kind of in this dilemma of being shaped by both of these men at the same time and not knowing which path to take yeah he, he, i think he you're right he's he's ultimately confused about and conflicted about who he is and who he's become and he chooses to become a killer and he chooses to, to end his own life and he kills his his abuser he kills hartman and and then he he shoots himself and and it's a, a devastating moment in the film, and it's incredibly shocking. And that's the final moment we have in boot camp. And right before that, though, there's an iconic scene where um, Pyle gets hazed by all the other corporals. And this is where he keeps messing up and causing more punishment for all of his, his fellow corporals. And it's in the middle of the night, and they tie him down with a blanket, and they all beat him with socks filled with soap bars. And um, every corporal takes part in this. And at the end, we have Joker, who even though is partnered up with with uh, Pyle and is trying to help him get along his training, he ends up being convinced and pressured into doing it too. And he's the last one to hit Pyle, and he hits Pyle the most and most aggressively out of everybody because he can't he can't take it anymore having Pyle slow him down and slow everybody else down. Yeah, and and Joker himself is. A character who I think holds on to his humanity longer than any other uh, soldier in the film, even throughout the the warfare scenes. And his individuality, yeah, which you were talking yeah, about earlier. And his individuality, and that's why even after the boot camp and we're, when we're in Vietnam, he's still pretty sarcastic and he's still like a wisecracker and he's still doing his John Wayne impression. And he is a, a contradiction from the other soldiers because they many of them have been hardened by actual combat and he hasn't seen combat yet. And so that's why he still has an innocent naivety about him because he hasn't been involved in real warfare and he hasn't seen death or, or had to kill anyone yet. He even gets uh, teased by the other soldiers because he doesn't have the thousand-yard stare like the others do. And the thousand-yard stare refers to that look that uh, war-torn soldiers have, that, that look of uh, like being in a daze and and being frozen and because they've become corrupted by war and warfare. And he lacks that because he's never been involved in real combat. And again, this this first act or this first short film ends with Private Pyle killing Hartman and then killing himself. And like you said, Pyle became exactly what Hartman wanted him become, to become, an emotionless killing machine. He just ended up becoming the prey and victim of, of his own success, which is really ironic. And then... The second part is basically opening up in in Vietnam, and it seems like Joker's been in Vietnam covering the war for a little bit of time. His hair's grown back. He's he's got that like confidence and the Joker mentality again. Now that he's out of boot camp, and like you say, he still has a, that individualistic attitude about him. But he's also kind of 
uh, I guess you could either call him a, con- a contradiction of himself or he has that representation of duality where he's wearing a peace symbol on his jacket, but he also has Born to Kill written on his helmet. So similar to Pyle, who had kind of like two identities forming, uh, there's a killer and a moral person. That's kind of like what Joker is kind of pushing off on himself in Vietnam now. Yeah, he's never had the opportunity to really uh, enact any kind of uh, violence upon another person. So he hasn't tapped into that darkness within him that all of us have within us, the ability to kill. And I think it's he does it more so as just like a joke because he's a joker, obviously. And so I think he wears these two contradicting items and symbols as, as a means to be funny because he doesn't under, understand um, that he doesn't understand how how he that he actually has the ability to be a killing machine and uh, he has the ability to be a killer. Yeah, I mean he he's pretending he's a real killer. He tells people he's been in the shit, but uh, he's basically run basically run away from every opportunity he has had to kill. He claims to Hartman that he's a killer in basic training, but then he takes up journalism. So he's kind of been running away from battling his whole life, despite or his whole time in in the army and the Marines, despite saying that he wants to fight. Yeah, and soldiers like Animal Mother, uh, they he sees right through Joker. And Animal Mother, in a lot of ways, is like a, the perfect Marine that Hartman was always trying to get out of uh, pile. He kind of did get that out yeah, of pile. He just, did get that uh, out of pile, but in, but in terms of Animal Mother is, is a more perfect version of it because he kills for his country. Yeah, like the ultimate Marine. Yeah, like he's just covered in bullets, and he's just he just looks like he's looking to kill people. You know what I mean? And he's he as a hardened crim as a hardened killer, he can see right through Joker. And he knows that he's never actually experienced combat before. In this situation there, with this squadron, uh, we get to experience the first uh, uh, battle sequence of the film. And Kubrick uses his very famous style of filmmaking, the tracking shots, very wide shots. He, You rarely see close-ups. It's oftentimes it, it's just these big shots where it feels like you're in the environment. And the set pieces in this film are massive and impressive. And it feels realistic, and even though the set pieces are giant and complicated, he still carried out his famous Kubrick perfectionism of shooting take after take after take and going over budget and and over schedule. And there's one scene where one of the actors had to be was lying down um, at in defensive position, and they filmed this scene so many times that this actor spent one an entire month lying on the ground. Yeah, it's the sniper scene where uh, obviously where the commanding officer of the of the squad is having them retreat, but then Animal Mother decides that he's going to lead an assault on this one sniper to save that guy. And in this kind of second short film, Joker finally does get a little taste of actual combat when the Vietnam. Uh, army and troops tried to storm their barracks and storm their army base, their marine base, and Joker finally gets a taste of shooting his weapon at men and, and firing his gun and, and getting a little bit of the shit, a little taste of it, and he seems to be enjoying it because he's at this time, you know, safe in the comfort. He's um, he's pretty safe there. They got a lot of guns pointing on that opening where all these men are pouring through, so it seems like it's almost an improbability that anyone would even get killed, any of the marines. So he seems to be like in a safe situation to be able to fire. He doesn't even take it seriously at first. He's like, oh, are they just trying to scare us? So he doesn't even think it's a, a real attack when it first happens. And so it, it, it shows that he, because he hasn't actually fought, he hasn't experienced it, he doesn't know what to expect. And then on that helicopter ride in, we get the horrible image of, of the guy in the chopper shooting away the innocent men and women who are just trying to I think they're just collecting food for their their village or their family. And um, Joker says this line. He says, how could you shoot women and children? And ironically, he has to do that at the end of the film. Mm -hmm. He has to do both kill a woman and a child. And the reason for that is that Gunner on the helicopter, he's just become a desensitized killing machine. And he lacks any kind of humanity now. And that's what happens in wars is men are stripped of their humanity and... Not only enemy soldiers, but the people who live in these lands, they become enemies, and soldiers will kill them without a moment's hesitation. And Joker just hasn't reached that point yet. Not yet, because they end up leading that attack on that sniper, 
and they end up getting towards the building and Joker gets in in the building close to the sniper and uh, finds out that it's just this young girl. Again, it's a, it's a child and a, and a woman. So he has to do what that chopper guy was doing and he has to kill this this young girl. And uh, just like Hartman warned earlier in the film during boot camp, if you hesitate, you won't be prepared to kill and you'll it'll cost you and you'll probably die. He hesitates and his gun jams with his hesitation and he's fortunately saved by one of his other men. And then they wound the young girl who is still alive but is experiencing a great amount of pain and she's she's asking the the men to shoot her and the men are questioning whether they should give her a mercy kill or just let her suffer because she killed a couple of their men and then animal mother decides that he'll allow them to kill her with a mercy kill as long as it's joker who does it and so joker has to come face to face with killing someone not just killing them out of defense but executing them and through the encouragement of his fellow soldiers, he ends up pulling the trigger and, and kills this young girl who was just defending her land. And, and it's, it's a straight-up execution. And then right after Joker shoots the girl, Kubrick keeps the camera on him. And then you can see in his eyes, he slowly develops the thousand-yard stare himself. And I think this scene was perfectly foreshadowed at boot camp with the soap scene, the hazing scene, where, again, when they attack pile in bed and they all haze and they all take their turns Pi- uh, private i mean joker's the last one to do it and he's peer pressured to do it he's like you you got to do this you got you have to do it just like everybody else and so that's basically him i think that was kubrick foreshadowing what joker would have to do at the end of the film peer pressured into killing that girl which he said he found disgusting in the helicopter. He was trying as as hard as he could to hang on to his humanity for as long as he could in both those instances, and it it reached the breaking point where he was put into a situation where he had to do it, and he he destroys and strips himself of his own humanity as in innocence once he pulls that trigger. And I think Cuba created a connection with this uh, teenage young girl sniper and Private Pile, where they're both very childlike because obviously she's a child and Pyle acts like a child, and maybe this is a an a metaphor for civilian casualties in war, which are always immense, and also showing the death of youth in war and the corruption of innocence in war and loss of innocence. And then this is even shown again when the troops are marching along that B- burning the, village, the silhouette of a burning village with flames, and they're singing the Mickey Mouse song, which yeah. is insanely weird yeah it shows that they've completely lost their humanity and their innocence and their morality to sing a children's song as they walk through a a war-torn ravaged town that's been completely destroyed by them and their their allied forces and joker says that in a world of even though he's inside a world of shit he's glad to be alive and is no longer afraid my favorite line of the movie is the, the the dead only know one thing. It is better to be alive. So Joker realizes that um, in war, all that matters is, is surviving. And I think that's also shown when animal mother and the others are standing uh, on the, oh, they're standing over their dead commanding officer and animal mother says something like better you than me. And all the soldiers have their own line. That's kind of along the lines yeah. of that, of that meaning and that, or that uh, sentiment. Yeah, all that matters is surviving. And the final image, I think, of the duality of man in that theme is is after they execute the little girl sniper, and in this scene when they're all standing above her, their faces are lit up half with fire and half with this blue glowing light from the moonlight from the night. And it's every one of their faces, all their soldiers are lit like that. And it shows just the duality of man again. This film was the uh, the last time Kubrick ever got an Oscar nomination. He got the Best Adapted Screenplay nomination. And despite the amazing career that Kubrick had in the incredible films, historic films that he made, Kubrick never won an Oscar for Best Director. Yeah, he, he has 13 Oscar nominations and he won for Best Visual Effects, I think, right? Yeah, for 2001. So he never won the Best Director Oscar. So it's kind of, I would say it could be the, the greatest controversy in Oscars history that Kubrick never won. He got an honorary Oscar, but I feel like, I it's mean, not that, the same. That, that's not the same. I mean, Scorsese probably maybe wouldn't have gotten an Oscar if he didn't make The Departed, which is absurd too. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, Oscars obviously are the pinnacle of, of the profession and the art. 
in terms of being honored, but still there is a bias to it. And like you just talked about earlier with your Harvey Weinstein story, there, there are, you know, un, there are controversies and it is very political. Yeah, it's very much about a marketing campaign more than anything. This film shot for so long that the actor Matthew Modine, who played Joker, in, in the span of the filming of the movie, he got married, conceived a child with his wife, and the child was born. Then the child turned one year old, all during the filming of this movie. And I, I think I read that Kubrick wouldn't let him leave for the birth of his child, but ended up, after like a ton of fighting, he, he was convinced that he would let him go for that. <laughs> yeah. Vincent D'Onofrio gained 70 pounds for filming to play Private Pile in Full Metal Jacket. It's the most weight ever gained by an actor for a specific role, just above the 60 pounds that Robert De Niro put on for Raging Bull. And that's a wrap on episode 41 of Raiders of the Lost podcast covering Saving Private Ryan, 1917, Fury, and Full Metal Jacket. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. Hit the notification bell so you know when new episodes get posted. Support us on Patreon monthly to get awesome perks. There's a $2, $5, and $10 category. Each one gets unique things sent to them. And thank you so much for tuning in. Take care, everyone.